Hello, everybody. My name is Jens Kettler. I'm with Focus Labs. And today we're going to speak about uh, good master data governance and uh, its relationship with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and we have a guest for that. Here with me is uh, John Simmons with uh, Sample MDG. Hello, John. Hello, Jens. Thanks very much. Good to be with you. Great to have you. Yeah. Do you want to introduce yourself and your company? Yeah, of course. So, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've um, I've been working in the SAP space for around 22 years now. Yeah. And um, when I think back to where I started, Master Data was my first job. Um, then I moved into SD as an SD consultant. Um, I went through ABAP, BW, architecture, various leadership roles. And um, for those of you who might know me on LinkedIn, I'm a pretty frequent blogger, writer of articles. I've written a couple of Two, two SAP Press books. I'm also an SAP Press author as well. Um, oh, that's and, great. Um, yeah, I'm based in the UK, and I currently lead the uh, the uh, consulting and advisory services group um, in Simple MDG. Great. Yeah, and actually, uh, Simple MDG or the company behind it, uh, which is uh, laid on and Focus Labs. Um, we have uh, partnered uh, around this product because uh, we we identified that the portfolios are a good. Uh, good match and makes sense uh, for, for our customers. Um, one of the problems that customers have is um, good master data quality and governance uh, about the, the master data. As the saying goes, um, uh, bad, bad data in and you will, uh, whatever business process and analytics you do, you will get very bad results out probably. And that's true in, in different areas. So um, the simple MDG um, software, which is a master data management software working with I, I believe uh, john different systems not just sap but but all the, uh, also other it systems it helps to improve and streamline the processes around master data and uh, the, the quality of the master data itself absolutely um, yes yeah. and, and and um yeah just to add to that you know simple mbg is built on sap btp so we take the best of the best from the technology that sap have to, has to offer and um we harness that to you know, help customers improve their their outcomes for, um, as you say, for, for AI and by, by building up a really solid data foundation for them. Right, and we've seen uh, improvements for our customers actually, um, for instance, in data analytics. So this is a, this is a good preventive way uh, to avoid errors and, and maybe even fraud cases. So it's kind of related to our RemQ product for business uh, transaction uh, monitoring and auditing. But it also helps in the migration to S4HANA because uh, you can, before you do the migration, um, correct master data, avoid duplicates, and improve the quality. And that makes the path to uh, S4HANA easier. So we have different connections between the Focus Labs uh, uh, software products and uh, Simple MDG. But with that, um, I hand it over to you. Uh, tell us about the product and how it helps with AI. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Jens. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, if we if we think about master data governance, and you've got some of the points there, mate. But our mission really is to is to maybe it's a cliche, but is to democratize master data. Okay, is to make it available to the business, um, and make it make all the rules and the administration and the standard operating procedures and everything else build that into the product, and so. Master data just becomes one of those things which happens and happens cleanly, effectively, and quickly and accurately. So that's kind of our mission statement of, of where we're looking. And what we needed, what, what we wanted to do is we wanted to take that kind of a step further and say, all right, well, now how can we build AI in? And how can we get AI to, to help us in our journey, if that makes sense? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, uh, Stefan, maybe two slides ahead, and then we can. Yeah, keep it right. Up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, so Jens, yeah, I mean, I'm sure I don't need to introduce AI to you or to any of our listeners at the moment. So, but, but I mean, suffice to say, a couple of these 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 um, statistics on the screen will help. You know, 94% of organisations say AI is critical to their success. 65% of organisations buy AI as a product, service, or package solution. There's a big however coming here, 
And if there was a report coming out of techradar.com recently that reported that apparently only 4% of organizations report that AI is actually a differentiator in transforming their business. And, and that's quite a startling statistic. And so we started to think about, okay, well, why is that? If so many, so many organizations are valuing AI and investing in AI and using AI, why are they not getting the business value that, that they should be? And one of the reasons for me is that AI is still an IT discussion. And if you, if you go out there and you Google um, anything about AI, you'll see loads of articles and blogs about AI solutions and applications, how they technically work, and how to get over technical issues like hallucinations and the like. And that's all important stuff, right? That's, that's really good stuff. But we want to take the conversation to the next kind of natural level now. And we want to speak about AI in real terms with business stakeholders, not IT stakeholders. So we want to see AI as, as being a, a kind of a business enabler instead of just a solution looking for a problem. So um, and that's one of the reasons why we think, you know, the, the SAP approach of labeling their AI hub as SAP business AI is, is a really good approach. It needs to speak to the business and not the, the IT team. And, and we're, we're really focused on just that in simple MVP. So how do we shift that conversation into business terms and away from IT terms? And one of the fundamental kind of currencies of AI is business data accuracy. So let's take an example. Um, if you have um, your lead times on your material master are incorrect for your raw materials, then any forecasting you do, any predictive models using, using AI, that will all be flawed. You'll get incorrect results. Now, there is a school of thought here which says that you know, AI and dirty data is kind of a match made in heaven. And I kind of agree with that. AI loves dirty data. But um, the AI needs to be targeted correctly. And that's where your data strategy comes in. So in some ways, we're moving away from that old mantra of garbage in, garbage out to a new approach of kind of garbage in, data governance with AI, accurate results out. Okay. So first, we think about our data foundation to establish that clean core as far as possible. Then upon on top of that, you build your data strategy. And that embeds AI as kind of a, an enabler to maintaining your own that solid data foundation. And that allows you know, further AI models to run effectively and produce accurate and meaningful results that kind of give real business value, if that makes sense. Absolutely. How does it work? Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> let's take a look at that. So if we go and jump to the next slide, then that's no, great. So, um, so if we look at this then, um, how do we get from data strategy, sorry, data foundation to data strategy? Well, actually what we need to do is we need to establish a, a solid data foundation first. And um, what do I mean by a solid data foundation? Well, I'm talking about a single version of the truth. So one data layer that can ingest data from various input applications, various sources, translate that data into a, into a readable format and then offer opportunities for governing the data and then the capability to replicate that data out to multiple targets. That's the picture on the left-hand side, right? That is um, the picture on the left-hand side, yes. Do, do you have examples for that? I mean, what is CRM and what data do you get out and what other systems are customers usually usually having? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we have um, numerous examples, but one, a good one I can think of, we have a, a company in the US where we are ingesting data from their Salesforce system, also mm -hmm. ingesting data from um, a PLM system of theirs. Um, as well as various um, non-ERP systems, in addition to manually created data, and all that comes in. So they've moved from that that old kind of outdated, confused data foundation where they had four or five different data sources as a data foundation. They've moved to Simple MVG where we're ingesting all that data into Simple MVG. That becomes your new data foundation, a single version of the truth where all that governed and clean data is replicated out to the systems on the right, which is your kind of OLTP, OLAP systems, such as mm -hmm. SAP 
non-SAP systems, S4 HANA, analytic systems, etc. The thing is, with this, you know, to get to a stage where you have that solid data foundation operating as a single version of the truth, you need that data strategy as a, as a kind of a guiding principle behind how you can treat your data as information assets. And our strategy in you know, how we work in Simple MVG, we call this a three-legged stool. Okay, so this is people, process, and technologies. And like a stool, if you take one of the legs away, it's going to fall over. So all three are really important. So, and we can help with some of that, and we have a partnership with SAP that can help as well. Um, so we're not just about the technology. And what I mean by that, if you think about people, so people are part of an organizational structure. And so it's really important for us, um, us to, as an enabler of, of this data strategy, to understand that organizational structure. Um, and the structure needs to reflect the importance of data to the organization. So quite often, but not always, that might mean the existence of a master data team, for example. And then also with regard to people, you know, training is really important. How often do you hear in, in ERP projects that oh, we, we haven't been trained sufficiently? You know? So we've tried to make our system, our simple MDG system, I mean, the, the, the word is in the name, it's simple, it's intuitive. Now, when, when we train our users, we, when we offer end training for our users, it's a few hours of training and they're ready. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's a very intuitive system. And so training is really, really important for us. And then when we think about processes, you know, I mentioned standard operating procedures earlier, and they're, they're really, I mean, everyone knows, kind of essential toolkit for effective data governance. Um, and again, you know, here, here's where we can help in Simple MDG. So, so we can embed you, um, our customers' SOPs into our standardized workflows in Simple MDG. And that allows, you know, we also allow master data experts to amend those workflows, create new versions of them, um, tweak them, et cetera, et cetera. And then templates, um, the, the kind of the second part of the processes. So this is the meat, really, the really the key part of Simple MDG. Everything runs from templates. Templates can drive business rules, and they might be validation rules. That could be internal validation rules, or it could be external, like address validation software, for example. Mm. Um, we have duplication checks. We have derivation rules where, for example, you, know, you put value 0, 2 in this field, and it defaults in 20 other values in, in, in other fields of the, base of, of the basis of that one value. We have calculation rules, so for example, you know, gross weight is calculated from net weights and packaging, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so this means that all of the business rules that you have for creation and for amendment of NASA data can be baked into Simple MDG. So you no longer, you no longer need to remember them, you don't need to track them. The application does all that good stuff for you. And then, sorry, can I just jump back to the last, the previous slide briefly, because I just want to talk briefly about technology, because this is a key point because that's where the magic happens, right? So I've talked a bit about how we can bake in all the processes and, 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 and the training, et cetera, into, into that. But the magic really is in the partnership between Simple MVG and SAP, because Simple MVG is built 100% on BTP. So we have native connections with all of those business AI services that are available on BTP. But we also partner with, with Datasphere. So that's, that offers your data cataloging, data analytics, along with SAP Data Analytics for Analytics Cloud. Okay, let me have a quick drink while we jump to the next uh, next slide. Right, so I guess one of the questions you're going to ask me, Jens, is this is all very well, what's it got to do with AI, right? Mm -hmm. so, okay, yeah, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's there are challenges with gen, um, generative um, AI and the, the partnership that I've been speaking about with SAP goes a really long way to uh, overcoming those challenges. So if we briefly explore those challenges, if you look at the picture on the right-hand side, and that, 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 first, that first graphic, that first question, so what were our revenue figures last month? So that might be a typical kind of natural language prompt you would feed into an LLM. Now, if you fed that into ChatGPT or whatever other um, LLM you, you use, it's not going to know because it doesn't have the knowledge of your organization. 
Now, traditionally, and I hesitate to use the word traditionally because that suggests it's a long time ago and this is all new stuff, but traditionally that was done using augmentation. So we would train existing models to make them aware of the corporate data, make them aware of the information. That would then lead to that second question, you know, what were revenue figures last month? Then you get an accurate answer. Sounds good, right? Problem is, that's got challenges of, 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 of its own. Augmentation really is challenging. It, it's, it's super costly to do that. So, so you need you need a very very detailed and technical skill sets available to you. And there's a quite and actually quite a shortage of those of that skill those skilled AI professionals in the market. And also, you know, how do you keep the model up to date? How do you keep it relevant? You know, continuous augmentation can be painful from a from a, from a cost perspective, from a from a um, just a, a cadence perspective, keeping, um, keeping that cadence going. And lastly, that kind of gold standard of AI responsibility as paramount. You know, how do you ensure your data is not leaked? So how do you do all that? Is it even possible to do all that given all that challenge? Well, it is. Um, about three or four years ago now, um, this this uh, this concept of retrieval augmented generations and RAG um, was came out. Now, now, I did promise at the start of this session, I talked a lot about talking about AI in business terms. So I don't really want to get deep into the technical and technicalities of what RAG is, but just a brief sentence on it. You know, it, it's a it's a technique for LLMs to get facts from external source, source sources. So meaning they don't need to know the knowledge themselves. It's a really innovative and easy way to connect organization knowledge to LLMs. All right, so I want to, I want to look at how we bring all those components together. So um, jump into the next slide then. Um, if we look at the strategic alignment of Simple MVG and SAP and bringing all those elements together. So we already know from our previous slide showing the data foundation that, that, that we can you know, ingest data from various different sources. We can, we can include Simple MDG as a sim, single version of truth for that data. Now the data fabric layer, that, that layer in the middle on the picture on the right, that gives you the ability to combine your data governance with AI services with the help of RAG. And so, um, when we do that, when we combine those um, those 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 services, we, we virtualize the data. We make it able to be consumed much more easily by the LLM. So instead of that traditional pull model where the user invokes an LLM, goes and finds the data based upon augmentation, the data the, the data virtualization model means that data is already there. Right? It's in one place, which is your single version of truth. And it's connected to your analytics hub in SAP DataSphere as well. So it shortcuts the AI process, makes it more accurate, makes it quicker, and above all, you know what we're all about. It makes it makes it simpler. All right, so let's move on. So um, now we've got the the data foundation established, if you like, the data strategy in place over over and above 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 that, and we're starting to get meaningful, accurate AI results. Great. Next question, so what's the relationship between AI and Simple MVG? And then what does a roadmap look like for us? Well, we start with, if we look at the box on, on the right-hand side and that first gray area that said principles there. So we start with the, the AI principles and you'll notice that these, if, 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 if you've read up on SAP, AI principles, these are exactly the same. These are SAP's three R's principles. And because we're a close partner with SAP, we've built on BTP, we use all their technology, we are following their, their approach now. So what we mean by that, so, so we're, we're relevant. So we're on BTP, means we can easily tap into the SAP Business AI Hub. We can use this to deliver our own AI services based upon templates that are available to us from SAP. Next step is reliable. So yeah, there's there's no good AI without good data. So the data has to be reliable. And that's where that single version of the truth comes in. So it means that the data we use in our models is kind of the most accurate and the best data possible, if you like. And finally, responsible. 
again, so we're aligned to SAP technology. So that brings all of the security, all of the compliance approaches, which are embedded into SAP applications that comes with it automatically. So that's already built into our, built into our solutions. What I do want to talk about is the boxes, yeah, the, the, the next phases. So if we go into those, we have three phases of our AI journey in Simple Energy. If we think about phase one of that journey, this is all about intelligent data management. It's about automating our capabilities to enrich data. So let's use an example for this. So imagine you're creating a material master record in your organization. So already without AI, we can deliver derivation rules that I spoke about earlier that you can default in values based upon other values. But there might be some ambiguity which requires like a trained human eye to look at. Well, that's, a, that's, that's, that's fine, it's not a problem. You know? We have the ability to recommend options for values, field group values based upon a machine learning model. So this allows your users the flexibility to select an option and then um, it kind of clears out the noise of irrelevant options, if you like, in order to offer up the best recommended values. And similarly, that, that second bullet point there, streamlining of data processes. You know, we can streamline classification of data. Again, based upon machine learning algorithms, we, we can suggest value amendments based upon, based upon business rules. So that's phase one. Now that's pretty much, pretty much complete. Okay, so we're, we're now thinking about building out phase two. What does phase two look like for us? So phase two is all about it's all about intelligent guidance. So this is where we start to get into the um, generative AI. We start to get into RAG. And one of the features of Simple MDG is kind of its intuitive simplicity of maintenance. So I mentioned already it's a 100% no code solution. I think I must have mentioned the ends about four times already. It's built on BTP. But, <laughs> What that means, what that means to our customers is they don't need an army of consultants to configure it. Okay? As I mentioned at the start, you know, th this is a business application, not an IT application. That, that's, that, that runs through the very veins of Simple MDG. So we're trying to make our customers self-sufficient. We don't want them to have to em em employ new consultants to run their, to run their, this application. That's not, a, not the intention. But we are taking the next step to make this even simpler to administer. So the plan here is to use generative AI to guide configuration of templates in a kind of a step-by-step -step fashion in response to natural, natural language prompts. So again, I'll try and use an example. Um, if you want to create a master data template for creation of a material, just say, Please show, me, please show me how to create a new template for creation of a material master. So that's the kind of thing we're working on. That, that should guide you through, 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 um, through a guided configuration. <clears throat> the next step for us is facilitating mass processing. So um, example use case I've got there is creating an item with a test customer. So should create me 50 customers for use in testing. Mm -hmm. kind of, okay. But that would take a long time in SAP to do that. Now we we have a mass processing function which shortcuts that that would take take minutes rather than rather than hours. With generative AI, we want to make that even shorter. We're really looking, we're trying to trying to get to seconds now. So um, we're really 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 pushing the pushing the envelope on that one. I think it's very interesting. I mean, uh, bringing these these things and making them available uh, to the different lines of business uh, that that use this uh, this tool and making them um, more independent from the IT organization. I mean, I think that's huge because whenever uh, the business tries to implement something or tries to change and improve something, what I see very often is that it's it's taking a long time to get the SAP basis guy to do something, to import and yeah. up something, change an authorization role, whatever you do, or change maybe even, even more complex, uh, work on the data pipeline because you need uh, different data uh, from from a system, right? And um, the, these times that you're waiting for uh, the other department uh, to do that job, uh, that's really slowing down, right? And this is something that you're accelerating here. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole point of, 
but like I say, democratizing the system. You know, we're, um, we're really trying to make this, make our customers self-sufficient. Um, we're not in the business of, of, of you know, this is speaking to someone who's a, who leads the consulting services, advisory services for Simple MVG. We're not actually in that game. You know, we want to make our customers self-sufficient. We want to make them be able to run it themselves. So that's yeah. what we're driving really, really hard towards. And that's why we have that, those, that really strong emphasis upon training, for example. So that when we when we implement with a project and and our projects are typically you know, eight to twelve weeks or less, you know, when we um, when we complete that project, we want to be happy in the sense that those customers are ready. They can they can deploy more data objects. They can different data objects. They can move on from materials. They can go into bombs or um, yeah. routing recipes, etc. All all that could be possible. Yeah, that's great. And everybody, um, if you have questions, um, put them in the chat here, or I think you can also reach out to us by email, labs at focuslabs.com. We will have a, a Q&A session at the end of the presentation here together with John. All right. Just a okay. reminder. Thank you, Jens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, should we talk about phase three? Okay. Yes, please. Right, so so phase three is really building on on phases one and two. And that means additional machine learning capabilities, additional gen, uh, gen AI capabilities. And firstly, you know, we want to build our analytics capabilities by by using AI to well to govern how effective our governance is in, 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 in effect. So so um, gen AI natural language prompts to check the health of the process. You know, are our SLAs effective? You know, where are the most common roadblocks in the process? And finally, you know, building out our AM, AI models to to help with documentation. And you know, I'm holding my hands up here, Jens. As someone who finds documentation does not come naturally to me, having an automated assistant to do that would be a godsend. So, so, um, so it's Absolutely. really, it's, it's really, it's, it's it's close to my heart to get this get this done as well. So, so it's 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 it's, it's about you know, taking it to the next level. What can we what are the bits of kind of important inf important work which which um, which um, our customers do, but may not necessarily be particularly difficult? And, and I'm classing documentation as as that. You know, writing down what you do is kind of dull. We all, it's 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 it has to be done, but it's kind of dull. So if we can take that off their plate and say we'll get AI hey, to do that for you. It frees them up to do more value-added tasks, as it were. As it were. Mm -hmm. So that's our journey through the phases. Now, this wouldn't be an AI conversation if I didn't start to talk about risk management, because I know a lot of people out there have a lot of concerns about AI, and particularly about generative AI. And there are risks around, you know, data, data privacy, AI bias. Um, Transparency and you know, general governance and oversight. I know that the the, uh, the writing on the slides is a little small here, but I just wanted to bring some of those issues to life, um, if I can. Um, so let's just, let's just imagine, from a data privacy perspective, let's just imagine you don't have security authorization to view or to change a specific bit of master data in mm -hmm. a company code, for example. Um, we need to make sure that we build our AI models to be cognizant of that security. I say to ensure that you can't just bypass it using Gen AI. Gen AI. And there's all sorts of compliance issues around that. I've listed out a couple of GDPR, um, a couple of other ones there. So, um, so that's the first step. AI bias is our second focus. And this is around um, what are the parameters we use to to um, to uh, to generate our, our our AI results. Can we fine tune them? Can we continuously monitor those parameters to make sure we're getting accurate results? This includes red teaming. So that's a kind of for those of you who don't know don't, don't, aren't aware of that red teaming is a form of testing where you try to try to break the model by coaxing it to behave incorrectly or unethically. So we we'll, um, so that's something we're working very hard on. On the bottom left, AI transparency, um, 
and that's kind of at the heart of what we do. Transparency is what the heart of what we do. And that's a, that, again, it goes back to this democratization and keeping things simple. So it, it, it basically means we're trying to make the complex simple. So we document and explain in simple terms how the models behave, what the rationale is behind the AI driven decisions and recommendations. And then finally, governance and oversight. No. Who governs the governor? <laughs> well, so the answer here, here is, you know, we have to build a structure around that. So we're building an AI structure now around um, a governance framework. We're putting clear roles and responsibilities within that framework and clear processes for all AI, AI um, development and changes and deployments, um, making sure that everything is everything is robust, everyone's accountable and fully tested using that AI bias testing I was talking about earlier and fully compliant as well. So I think what I've hopefully done, the end of that point is, is giving you a kind of an overview summary of, of where we're looking in terms of um, building that data foundation to start with. And then from that data foundation, and moving it on to to um, building a good data strategy to maintain that that foundation effectively, and so I suppose my my message here is you know Simple MBG with SAP together is your partner in pulling those the three things together we talked about okay data foundation data strategy effective and accurate AI. So everything we do as an organisation will align with SAP technologies, SAP strategy, SAP compliance, and hopefully having laid out that AI roadmap for us, and you know, that gives it gives them an understanding of, of how we're gonna do that. We're gonna be continually refreshing that roadmap. Um, and typically what we, we will do that in response to customers' requirements. So we're always talking to our customers. Um, we're very customer driven, very flexible and agile organization, which is great. But Having said that, what we're trying to do is um, put some foundations in around that flexibility so that we always, always, always follow and abide by those underlying principles, you know, relevant, reliable and responsible. OK, so I think that's probably I me. Mean, I'm going to have to take a drink before I die. <laughs> My throat's very straight. All right. All right. But, but it was very insightful, um, and I believe that uh, it, it really uh, kind of outlined the, the roadmap for the business uh, to deliver successful uh, uh, solutions and, and improve the business. So I hope uh, with this approach, I'm sure with this approach, you will increase the number of only 4% uh, business value projects uh, in, in, in the AI domain. Uh, it's quite a startling, high number. Quite a startling <laughs> statistic, that one, isn't it? it really yeah, is. yeah, interesting numbers. Yeah, interesting numbers. Yeah. It definitely should be higher. And I think yeah. here we have a very robust uh, framework uh, to do that. Yeah. And as you mentioned, uh, really, especially here, I mean, the, being reliable and um, and responsible is, is super important, right? I mean, the, the SAP security aspects uh, that, that get reflected here you think about forecasts and stuff, data that must not be um, exposed to, to people that don't have authorizations, for instance. Uh, I think that's a, that's a difficult thing to do, but I can really see how in this setup it works. Yeah? And, and that's, a, that's a very important uh, uh, factor. Yeah, Great. absolutely. And I think overall, you know, the, the message is, when you mentioned that 4% statistic, but we know that 90, 94% of, of organizations um, see AI as critical. Just want to close, we want to close that gap. Uh, yeah. Now if we can use simple MDG to help close that gap, then great. But because you're not going to get, you're not going to get any more, from, any, any higher than 4% if you don't have that data foundation and your accurate data to support your AI models. Absolutely. Thank you very much, John. Let's directly jump into the question and answers uh, right. and, and see what our customers say. Excellent. Thank you very much. A lot of insights there. Oh, I see here we are, the men in black of uh, master data governance. 
<laughs> My name is Stefan. I'm running the webinar technically. I'm going to help through the questions. And before we get to them, uh, I'd like to go to um, do a little survey, a little poll consisting of four questions where we just see where we stand, where we all stand on the topic. So don't worry about your compliance. It's, you know, it's anonymous. It's just about clicking yes or no just to see where we all stand. And we can then uh, have a small discussion about what the results actually say about the situation. I'm going to start with the first one. And the first question should be coming up on your screen just now. And it's simple. Is master data governance currently a priority for your organization? A priority in terms of is this being, I mean, there's about tons of priorities in every organization. And then it depends on where, uh, who takes action and who doesn't. So do you feel somebody is taking action? Is there a, a, a pipeline, a plan for this? I'm going to leave this open for another five seconds. And I hope this to be a 100% yes um, uh, situation. Let me just wait another two. Closing now. And showing you guys the results. And yes, this is a winner. Uh, John, what do you think? Does this uh, surprise you? Are you happy about this? What's your experience in other companies where you say, w when it's not, why isn't it? Well, firstly, Stefan, it's reassuring, which is great. Mm. Um, master data is a priority because it does underpin everything. We've explored a little bit of that in the presentation. Um, so, yeah, very reassuring. Um, what we do tend to find is there is a gap between intent and action. Ah. And, and so, um, yeah, what we're trying to do is get the message out there and get the understanding of master data, the importance of master data to transformative technologies like AI so that actually people can you know, get some skin in the game, if you like, and really, really understand that they have to put some effort into master data and not just talk about it. What could be the blockers from your experience? Is it internal communication about the understanding? Is it capacity? Is it technical reasons? What do you think? Yeah, I think people just see master data as an enabler of a system of record, in effect. And I think that's probably a, a problem with a perception in the ERP space generally is that ERP is seen as a system of record, whereas actually mm. can be a system of differentiator. And there's still a lot of resistance to that because um, organizations very naturally will tend to put all their, all their um, R&D dollars into sales or into um, marketing or into building up products, et cetera. That, that makes perfect sense. But you need that data strategy to be able to build on, to be able to drive on those those functions of sales and marketing and everything else. And that's, I think, where the understanding is lacking of where data is, is, is so critical. You know, we're all, we're all running 100 miles an hour with the ground crumbling away behind our feet. The last thing we want to do is stop and look behind us at the data. But we have to do that every now and then. And that's the message we're trying to put forward. Yes, it, it sounds like the need to clean it up because it's a backbone. Let me jump to the second question and see what happens there. And here we go, AI. Have you used AI for your data strategy and checks so far? Just a simple yes or no, so it probably is going to differentiate in to what extent, if at all. I'm going to leave this open. I I suppose, and I'm pretty curious what the results would say this this is still new to the field as you said yourself john let me just leave this open for another two seconds closing now make your bets please <laughs> and here we go 17 percent yes so it shows people don't really think of ai yet because they don't trust it so what what do you think where does that come from because they don't know how Partially, I think that's probably more a result of the question being aimed at data strategy. Mm. Um, so I would suspect that a lot of people that have answered no, maybe they their organizations have dabbled in AI for other purposes, um, for predictive purposes, whatever, but not for their data strategy. And I think that's probably the key message that we're trying to get across is if you're using AI, then you need to embed it right from the word go, right from the start in your data foundation, embed that AI. So, so I'm not surprised at that, at, at, at that, at that result. Um, 
my mission my mission here is to increase that percentage now excellent jumping to the third and you should be seeing it on the screen now did you automate all of your data management workflows so far or most of them to not say all so is it is it are you making use of automation in general leaving this open for another five seconds and i think jens this is this is also a classic for remq in terms of when people think they need to check things manually uh, as opposed to um, using a tool that can do the job quicker and uh, more automated leaving this open for another two seconds closing now oh that's interesting it's a 50 50 here <laughs> what do you guys say on this jens what do you think what's your take yeah <clears throat> i think um i mean automation is uh, is of course key but um, you can look at it from different perspectives i think the, the problem here is that what workflows is in there i mean um i think all the workflows are automated um right you get a ticket you work on it you decide to do something but i think the key here is that you can leverage ai to actually even take away that part of the work and automate it clean up data for instance which was done very often or I think still is done in many cases manually. Somebody has to so go not, there not and having decide. Anyone who does this, who does the trigger manually, so it's not somebody mm -hmm. typing in something, but it being recognized by AI yeah. and then actually triggering a ticket. Yeah, for example, the, what mm -hmm. John mentioned, like create documentation, right? I mean, there's so many things where the workflow, at such, it's automated, but the mm -hmm. it just sends you a ticket, and then you still have to do a lot of manual work. Mm -hmm. I even doubt that from my perspective that all the workflow is automated. I still imagine people, you know, typing away and clicking things or writing an email even if there is a problem. So maybe we can get away of that and, and, and use our, our, uh, our work power in a different way. Jumping to the last before we get over to the questions. Um, and the last question out of that four question poll is, is there a roadmap for master data governance in your organization? So we cleared it in, in question one. Is this a priority? Yes or no? Is there a roadmap in terms of, is there a plan? Have you really thought about it and not just knowing that you should do something about it, as John mentioned early on? Uh, I'm gonna leave this open for another two seconds from now. Please make your clicks. Closing the question now and showing you guys the results. Well, not so much. So the awareness is bigger than the actual plan i would say is that the thing you were talking about john like you know execution versus theory it is it is and it's it's one of those topics that's very difficult to get people excited about because must mm. data is quite dry and mm. it doesn't have any tangible benefits like like um you know a sales strategy or a marketing strategy in my hand my, my hand unless you dig right down into the strategy and, and you look at the 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 follow-on functions, which can happen naturally after the um, data strategy. So um, I'm not surprised at, at that um, about roadmap. Um, I think what we need to do now is to say, right, okay, so look at it holistically. If you can look at your data as an enabler of business growth, of, of productivity savings, and all those kind of good stuff that, that we mentioned, and of accuracy, then we can start putting a dollar value on that, on that, um, on the business business data strategy, and that's when we can drive forward real results. Anything to end the ends? <laughs> John is all, all said. <laughs> all said. Yes. Okay. Thanks for that. Thanks, thanks everybody for participating. I know sometimes it feels a bit, you know, how far, how, how much can I? Uh, can I disclose about my organization and what we're thinking of? So thanks for the for the trust. As I said, this is anonymous. We're, we're measuring this uh, uh, to also see in a couple of months when we pick up the next webinar on the top, uh, what has happened, are there any changes? And usually they actually are. So it is about awareness. So thanks you, you both for the webinar so far. We'll jump to uh, the questions now, if that's okay with you. And uh, the first one is, I'm gonna read it out as it is. Is it a compliance problem to feed AI with my organization's data? Like, I'm afraid somebody's watching me. I'm not, you know, people start with thinking, 
oh my god i have alexa installed in my house what what is this going to do to my company <laughs> yeah what a what a great question stefan yeah that's absolutely um, absolutely right and and i think the answer is well firstly yes it would be it would be a problem if we were using kind of an off the shelf open source llm but we're not okay so so remember you know i'm going to repeat myself again remember that simple mvg is housed entirely on btp and so any ai service we call is either within our own network in which case it's restricted to the single tenant btp account where your customers applications hosted or our customers applications hosted or it's an external call to the SAP Business AI Hub, where data anonymization of you know, personal identifiable information is kind of built in a standard. So in short, I think the answer to that question is your privacy is covered. Um, it's covered by the best of the best from SAP. Remember those three R's, you know, reliable, responsible, relevant. Um, the, the reliable, sorry, the responsible bit it's a bit about data, data privacy, absolutely paramount. But is it then a question of trust or, or is there a frame where you say, well, this is still within the AI, within a certain aspect, within a certain technical uh, uh, area is, uh, is dealing with my data or could it happen that it goes out somewhere where I don't have control over it? Or is it anonymized then as far as you can answer that? Yeah, so, so the, the AI that you would be using to drive your data strategy would be um, internal only. Mm -hmm. So, so, it, 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 so yes, there are capabilities to anonymize data if you go externally and you feed things to external customers or whatever, and, or, or perhaps you, you want to build a hub that your suppliers can come into and you want to build some AI into, into that. Yeah, there's a degree of anonymization of data which is absolutely crucial that we need to do. SAP provides us with tools to do that. So um, if you look at Datasphere, for, for, for example, they have, um, their AI hub within Datasphere is lots of tools around anonymization um, of data, absolutely critical. You can't even implement some of the services without without ticking those boxes. So um, when you go and, you, and, and we start building up our, our AI services that we offer, pretty much the first thing we address is data privacy. So yeah, it's covered. So could we say, and this is my words, nobody said that, could we say AI in this case is, is like another internal super powerful colleague? So it's, it's a part of the team, let's put it that way. Is that, could we see it like that? Yeah, absolutely. It's part of the team, but without the, without, the, without the possibility of that team member going to the pub and telling his mate about it, because they didn't do that, so yes. <laughs> so so it, it is the time where we say we can exclude human errors here, I get it. And human emotions, <laughs> get it, which is maybe not the worst thing to do when it comes to master data governance. Right. Okay, okay. Jumping to the next one. Also, you guys, if you feel there is something open, you have another question, please use the chat. We're going to read out the next one I have here, and it's okay. This is straightforward. Can you give me an idea of how you implement Simple MDG? Is there a project timeline? Something we need to consider? How, how does it work? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so how do we implement? We so we, again, you know, we use the best of the best from SAP. We partner with SAP. As part of that, there's SAP's Activate methodology. And we use that, and that we, we use those six phases. And off the top of my head, I remember those phases that discover, prepare, explore, realize, deploy, and run. And so we use those phases. We're aligned to Scrum principles as well. So we're trying to keep ourselves extremely flexible, extremely agile. In terms of timing, um, a basic deployment for a, a base customer, and bear in mind we have we have three levels of subscription. We have base, we have premium, and we have enterprise, depending on the number of data objects that you want to deploy the customer. A typical, let's, let's use a basic deployment of, for example, the two main objects that we tend to deal with are customers and vendors and materials. Three objects, let's say. So, that will take around anywhere between eight to 12 weeks to deploy that. And the reason why we can do that very quickly and realize that quick time to value is because we have, we have standardized templates that we can roll out and we have standardized workflows. We can build those out in conjunction with the customers and we can tweak them for the customer's business values. So 
when we look at the projects and how, how, how it works, we have kind of um, fit to standard workshops. We, in those workshops, we build the templates. Um, we have sprint style testing. And to be honest, Stefan, the, the biggest delay is normally in the technical onboarding of us as a vendor. So you know, if we can get that done fast and the overall time comes crashing down normally. And, and you know, as I said, that's because we do have those standard templates, those rules, those workflows that we can use. We also take time in the project to train the customers, the user system as an end user. I think I mentioned in the presentation earlier that, that it's really quick training, you know, it, it, it's hours. You know, um, it's a little longer for, for, to administer the system, but again, we're talking about training data and users, not IT users to do that. So, so it's, it's, it's still very quick. What can, a, what can a potential customer do to actually prepare himself for a, for a first conversation with you? So what would you say, you know, what would happen then? What would you ask for? So they have a little bullet pointy type of list where they say, okay, I'm going into, into the topic with John and I've prepared this and that. Yeah, so what the, the kind of 10 things, the, the main question we, we, we like to ask is, okay, which data do you see as your information assets? Which is the most critical data to you? And so if you're, for example, if you're a mining company, it could be your, your enterprise assets. Um, if, if you're a retail company, it, it, it might be your article master because there's, there's millions of records there. So these are the kind of things that we are. So, so once, once we establish what is the most critical information assets to drive their revenue growth and their productivity, that's when we can say, right, that, that's where we'll, we'll, we'll build our solution to start with. And typically what we see, Stefan, Typically what we see is a client will implement simple NDG and they'll tick off those, those key information assets to start with. And so, right, we're going to govern those to start with. And then what, we'll, what we would see is as they get used to governing those, they'll give us a call and they'll say, hey, John, we, we're, governing our, we're governing our customers fine now. We want to extend this to vendors and materials or pricing or source list, purchase info records, all these other objects. Great. My question to them would be, what do you need from us? Their, their, their answer quite often is nothing. We're just telling you we want to do it. So we, our mission is to make them self-sufficient to be able to do that. And so um, we start with understanding their pain points and their problems and what their, what their information assets are. And then we build up their knowledge and say, OK, once you understand how the tool works, then you identify future information assets which you realize can can benefit in the process as well excellent i would say i would have a roadmap now what to do and how to approach you and with what data so thanks for that john thanks jens great uh i don't see any more questions here so i'd say if you if you uh run into some you know sometimes you need a topic like this uh you need to let it set, sink in um write us an email to labs at focuslabs.com jens has mentioned that early on as well uh, we do read our emails, so we're going to forward them to either John or Jens. And um, any last words from you guys? Not the last words forever, but for this session now. Just to say thank you for having me on. I really, really enjoyed it and good questions as well. Um, I'm very intrigued by the poll answers, so so that was very, inter very interesting. So um, thank you very much. And yeah, as you've already said, Stefan, please feel free to reach out. Um, I can be... Um, I can be found on LinkedIn. I can be found just john.simmons at simplemdg.com or through or through you guys. Either way is fine. But thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, John. Excellent. See you, everybody. Everyone, Thanks very have much. Have a nice day. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.